All right, uh, for lesson two six here. I'm actually, uh, before I get started working on this lesson, I'm gonna show you what I've done starting for chapter three. So this is the very last lesson of chapter two. Next week, all we're doing is a test. Everything else is getting your work caught up. But what I wanna show you is uh, specifically Google Classroom. I know y'all kind of got back, back and forth, like maybe you got used to power school learning and that's fine if you wanna keep using it. Uh, I have had some feedback. I've been asking students, what can I do that's better? And they said, the, really the only thing I've heard so far, and if you have more, please let me know, is that uh, all your other classes use Google Classroom. I'm maybe the only one and you wish I used Google Classroom. So well, here's what I've done. I've tried to make it where you can do everything from Google Classroom. Starting on chapter three, what's going to happen is you'll have these uh, folders for the, by chapter, kind of like I do in Power School Learning as a page. So I went to classwork and on chapter three, I know for you, if you click this, it won't quite open yet because it's not open on Power School Learning. But what's going to happen is I'm going to click this first link and it's going to open up the Google Doc. And this, if you've been participating in class, will look very familiar to you because this is the same four things you've been seeing on Power School Learning now for a long time. And so uh, let me come over here so we can compare. I know you can't see chapter three yet because I have not opened it up. You can see it's not published. That's why for you, the Google Classroom link won't exactly work once you click it. But the same four things that are listed for three, one, one, two, three, four are put on this page here. And so if you want to use Google Classroom, you'll click the three, one link or whatever lesson and it'll open up this page. You'll take your attendance or you can scan the QR code, obviously. If you're not live, you can watch the YouTube videos. If you are live, you obviously don't have to worry about this, but uh, you can now from Google Classroom, I've figured out a way to where if you click this link, uh, what's gonna happen again, starting next nine weeks. So starting two Mondays from now, it'll open you up straight to the lesson, Bell Ringers DOLs where, where you take your exam. And so this will open up and you can submit your answer. So again, I did that straight from Google Classroom. You won't have to use PowerSchool Learning if you don't want to. Now, if you're so used to PowerSchool Learning, you wanna continue, I will update this side as we go. And so you can continue using that. So just wanted you to know that, that uh, Google Classroom is gonna be working for you if you prefer that. So just trying to help you guys out. I'm trying to take any feedback possible. I wanna be the best teacher I can be for you. And so that's the feedback I heard is use Google Classroom. Well, there you have it. It's going to start working uh, just like that. So, and I put just your normal links here. I also put in, just so you know, the Desmos links. So if you click this, uh, the first one is just a blank Desmos calculator. But the second one, if you click that, these are the programmed ones I have. So if you need to do insolve, piecewise, inverse, compositions, regressions, any of that that we've used so far, you can click one of those and it'll open up the graph directly from there. So if you need to do piecewise, something like that. Okay, with that, let's get started. Today's lesson two six, and I've actually programmed, let me just do it from here. Uh, nope, can't do it from this one. If you go to lesson two six, uh, I have pre-programmed some Desmos graphs for us. And so go to lesson two six, lesson two six, and under number two, the third bullet down, it should say click here for your Desmos graphs. Click that one. And it'll open up to this window here. Okay, so we're going to use that in a second. Today's lesson, at the end of chapter two, we've been doing so much stuff by hand. Today, we're going to focus on how do you do this work with calculators. Today is a technology day. Let's start with this bell ringer. This bell ringer reviews problem, this problem right here review stuff from lesson two, four and from two, five. So it reviews the solving from two, four and it has a rational, which was two, five. So it says this, Brent, meaning me, dealing with the blood disorder of diabetes must closely monitor my blood sugar, which I'm gonna call SFT. Now, what I told you in lesson two, four is if you have a word problem, once you see what anything's labeled as or what something represents, box it up. It's, the very, it's a huge key to word problems in my classroom. So as you work through this, you see, okay, blood sugar is SFT, box it up so we don't forget. It says, after eating a meal, the rise of my blood sugar can be modeled by this equation, where T is time. Okay, I'm gonna box that up. It just told me T is time. If 
my blood sugar needs to remain at a level of 80 milligrams or greater. This or greater, we're gonna talk about more today. That's what today's all about. Less than, greater than, all that. But it says, if it must remain at 80 or greater, I'm gonna box up that 80. About how much time can Brent wait to eat another meal? So there's a couple things. It gave us an 80 milligrams per deciliter. What is that for? Is that a time or is that a blood sugar? That's a blood sugar. It also says at the beginning of the sentence, if my blood sugar needs to remain at a level of 80, it's a blood sugar. So to solve this problem, what we need to do is plug in 80. So does plug 80 plug in for the S of T or for the T? What is it? If it's a blood sugar, which one's S of T? So we're going to plug in 80 for S of T right there. So what I told you on lesson 2-4 is when you solve these problems, what you do, if you want to use technology, is you divide the equation at the equal sign. And so the left of the equal sign, you put Y equals. And the right of the equation, you can put Y equals. If you graph these, the intersections or intersection, depending on how many there are, would be the solutions. Okay, so with that, let's go over to the graph. If you pulled up these pre-programmed graphs already, this should pop up. This is the equation. I typed it in and I got in a window where you can see it all. What I have not added was the 80 part. So what you do is just click on the equation and press enter and it'll add an equation line just below it and type in Y equals 80. The problem said my blood sugar needs to remain at 80 or greater. So does that mean I'm healthy? I'm going to convert this or translate it to visual here. Let's translate the English into math uh, visuals. If I had to be 80 or greater, do I want to look at the graph above the red line or below the red line? It's supposed to be supposed 80 to be greater. Above. above. I want it to be above 80. So I'm looking at these pieces that are above. And we can eliminate some portions. So this is also from lesson two, four. You can, when it's real world, which our problem was, real world, the only situations I know where you cannot have the graph go outside the first quadrant, or this is the quadrant one right here. I'll do Q1. The only time I know that you can go out of quadrant one is if it's money. You can have negative money, but most everything else, you cannot have negatives. So that means this part over here that's in quadrant two, you can scratch that out. This is the y-axis. Well, in this problem, it would be the sugar axis. So I'll do S of T. And this one is the x-axis, which is referring to the T in this problem, which is time. So we can't have negative time, so I erase that. Nor can I have a negative blood sugar. That's impossible. If you think about what's the lowest amount of sugar you can ever have in your blood, would it be negative amount? The lowest would be, uh, just in general, what's the lowest, a person's been dead for two weeks, how much sugar do you think you'd find in his blood? Zero. Zero. So the lowest you could ever have is zero. Now, why is that important? At this stage, the problem ends. There's nothing that happens after here. This is like death, if you will. Now, if you're wondering, why did I put Mr. my own name, Mr. Voorhees, on the problem? Well, it's because of this. I didn't want to be calling anybody else out saying you're dead. So I'll just say, I'm dead. This is the point where I'm dead. Does it matter if someone later, this is time, if someone comes in one, two, three, four hours later and shoots me with some sugar, will that affect anything? No, I'm already dead. So all this part of the problem is irrelevant too. So really you're only looking from here to there. That's a what, uh, five hours, six hours, seven hours, eight hours. That's only about eight hours that even matter on this graph. So in a nutshell, you could, not Mr. Only, say that again what's up you cut off a little bit like like 20 seconds oh i'm sorry yeah. what i'm saying is uh this is the point of death you, the lowest sugar you could ever have is here now from the time i die well that means no sugar whatsoever in my body nothing else on the graph matters it's irrelevant so that's why i scribbled out all this it's the same thing as if i put the restriction Sorry, I gotta clear this off. If I put a restriction on this graph and said, only look when T is between zero and what was it, eight hours? I'll say nine hours. 
I'm only looking at this part of the graph. I'm not looking at the whole thing. The reason I'm taking off some of this restriction is because we don't deal with negative time. So that's why I said zero, the lowest amount of time we'd have is zero. And if this is the point where I die, oh, it's like 8.2023, I could look at the graph stopping there at 8.023. So that's the part of the window I'm looking at. And specifically we want when the graph is greater. So I can, if I eat a meal here, my blood sugar should go up as my body digests the food. But after it's all digested, this would be the point when it's all digested, my blood sugar will start to drop. Now I'm okay until I get to this point right there. That's when I'm gonna have problems. Now I'm gonna let you figure out what is that problem. I'm not gonna give you the answer. I'm gonna let you use your Desmos and find it. If you're watching this video not live, just pause the video and pick it up in a second. So once you find your time, you can go to lesson two, six. I gotta erase this here. You can go to two, six and submit your answer in this exam two, six link. You start here, number one, you can type in how much time before eating another meal. It says round to the nearest 10th. And so since 10 has one zero, you need to round to one decimal place. Okay, really quickly, why is 12 not a good answer? I mean, they crossed there. Why can I not wait 12 hours? Because I'm already dead. If I die at this point, then what happens at 12, 12 hours, basically four hours later, is irrelevant. Why is this not a solution over here? Negative 1.59569. Why is that not a solution? Because it's negative time. It's negative time. I can't go backwards in time to eat a meal. So you would look starting from zero up until it goes outside the first quadrant. This would be the only I, uh, places you could find solutions. It's just this part of the graph that stayed in the first quadrant. That's why this is the only one right there. All right, with that, let's go on to number two. Number two says, what equation represents a slant asymptote? And so we gave you some rules in lesson two five about asymptotes, specifically, if it's a vertical asymptote, this I'm from the cheat sheet. I did vertical asymptotes as number two. The number two thing for uh, vertical asymptotes was where the denominator does not, or denominator equals zero. So if you wanted to solve for the vertical asymptotes, you would have to set this as being equal to zero and solve that. But that's not what this problem asks for. It does not ask for a vertical asymptote. That's what the V stands for, vertical asymptote. This asks for a slant asymptote, which came from number three. Number three was under the heading of horizontal asymptotes. And there were three different rules. You might be going, well, it doesn't say horizontal either. Well, yeah, I'll get there. So here are the rules. There was each DC, there was Bobo, and there was Botten. And so each DC said, if the exponents are the same, divide your coefficients. So you would look in the top and bottom. Are the exponents the same when you look at the largest exponent? So you don't read all the way across. You just look at the largest. Are the exponents the same? No. No, if it's not the same, then you ask, is it bigger on bottom? By the way, if it was this, if they were the same, the answer would have been two divided by one. You divide your coefficients. Exponents are the same, divide coefficients. We would have said two over one and gotten two, but that's not right because they're not the same. So that's wrong. So I erase it. This one. It says bigger on bottom, y equals zero. This would be the horizontal asymptote. Is it, are the powers bigger on bottom? No, that's incorrect. So it must be bottom. What does bottom stand for? Bigger on top, no horizontal asymptote. If it's not a horizontal asymptote, it's a oblique or slanted. That's not how it's called oblique, it needs to be a Q, sorry, not a G. Oblique asymptote. And the way to find it is by division. So we have two types of division from lesson two, three. There's synthetic and long division. Synthetic's the shorter one. If you can solve for X, you can use synthetic. Do we know what X equals right now in the denominator? No. No, so you have to use long division. So to solve that, we write it out the divisor, X squared minus X plus five as a remind, remain, excuse me, as a reminder, we call this the divisor d of x. And we treat the top as like the function f of x. 
The divisor is going to go into technical term is dividend. If you remember that from algebra two, I know it's been a long time. It's been COVID, but that's what they call it. So how many times, here's how we do this. How many times can X squared go into two X cubed? What would you need to multiply X squared by to get two X cubed? Two X. There you go, two X. So we distribute that two X across. So two X squared times two X is two X cubed. And then again, we distribute negative X times two X. Negative two X squared. Thank you, Diego. Five times two X. 10x. All right. Now the part that people mess up on on long division is here. I call it the fundamental rule of division. It's that when you go to simplify this, most students by nature scratch these out, but then they combine the terms here. But for these to truthfully scratch out, these would have to be opposite symbols. So here's the fundamental rule of division. When you do long division, switch every single sign at this stage. So all the signs switch. The negative, the positives become negative. The negatives become positive. Now I can technically cancel those out. What's a negative 5x squared plus 2x squared? Negative 3x squared. This is a minus 18x. The plus 1 drops. And I need to do this one more time. Since the last term, this will be the last time. You ask yourself, what do I need to multiply x squared by to get negative 3x squared? Negative 3. Negative three, which right here, that's going to be our solution. Our solution is going to be y equals 2x minus 3. That's it. That's an asymptote because it has, it's in the form of y equals mx plus b. It's going to be slanted. It's going to have this, it's going to rise two units for every one unit or run. It goes two over one with a y intercept of negative three. But to finish off the problem, we would call this, just as a review here, this is called the quotient, so q of x. If you multiply it by negative three, we'd get negative three X squared. Negative X times negative three, it's a positive three X. And then negative three times a positive five is negative 15. I combine these like terms. Well, oh, sorry, what's the fundamental rule of division? That's right. I almost forgot the fundamental rule of division. There we go. Switch them. That cancels. Here I have negative 21x plus 16. That's what we call the remainder right there. There's nothing else to drop down, so it's the remainder. That's the quotient. The quotient is the slant asymptote. And I'll show you this graphically. So if you were ever taking an exam that's multiple choice, Asymptotes, you can get the answer. I'm going to clear this one off and press the home screen to get back to the center. This is number two right there. If you graph it, what an asymptote does is it follows the direction, like the graph will approach it. It's almost like the, uh, the behavior or a limit of the graph. So this is saying the slant parts of the graph will follow this equation. So I'm going to come back over here and press enter. Y equals 2X minus 3. What that means is if I zoom out, the slanted parts of the graph will follow that blue line. You see how similar the slanted parts are? Not this inside twist thing, but the slanted part, you see how similar those are? As you zoom out, you get to a point where you can't even see the difference between the two. Maybe just a little bit in the middle, but we're not concerned about that. We're just worried about the slant of the graph, the slope of the graph, if you will. They're exactly the same. So we did it right. If you're taking multiple choice test, you could just graph the original problem and graph the answer choices Let's just say you had, I don't know, 2x plus 7, uh, y equals x minus 5, and maybe you have y equals 3x minus 1. And you just ask yourself, which one looks the most alike? I'll do the correct answer last. Does that match the slant? Are they basically one on top of the other? No. no. Does this match the slant? No. no. Does this match the slant? No. This would be... The answer and you can do this even if it's not slanted so i like this question come up yesterday students like what if 
it was asking for like vertical asymptote. So I'm gonna just change my problem so I have a vertical asymptote here. So now on this problem here, you can see I have a vertical asymptote. It goes uh, right here in the center. It's at negative three. And so if I graph this, the answer is going to be X equals negative three. There's going to be the answer, but I'm gonna type in answer choices real quick and show you this, it works the same way. So I'm just making up stuff right now. And again, I'm making up stuff. Don't be asking where did that come from? It just came from my brain randomly. Okay, if I looked at, again, I'll look at the wrong, the correct answer last. It just doesn't help being the same color. Let me switch it. Okay, if you looked at this one and I zoomed out, are these two on the, that's just a tough equation. Let me make this easier to see. I've got a lot going on in there. Would this match the end behavior? No, it's off. You see, it doesn't follow it there. Uh, would this one match there? No. Would this one match? No. Which does match is this one. It goes right between the pieces. Again, I didn't pick a very good equation to do this. Um, I could probably do that. There we go. That'll be an easier one to see. This goes cuts right through the, the center. So that would be the right answer. That would not be right. That would not be right. That would not be right. This would be correct. So the idea of asymptotes, you can do it by graphing and just seeing which one falls, uh, follows the equation. So that's the bell ringer, all right? Today, like I said a second ago, we've done a lot of algebra all through chapter two. Today, I'm gonna to show you straight up graphing the whole way. If you wanna watch the algebra, watch the YouTube videos, but I'm gonna focus on how can you use Desmos to solve all this stuff, kind of what we've been doing, I'm gonna put it together. I have review problems, but I think right now um, I have, again, videos for this. I don't want to spend the time reviewing because I've noticed some students just get lost because here I would be doing more algebra. I'm going to skip this. And at the end of the lesson, if you want me to go back, I can. But some students just want to get to work. And so I want to give you all that opportunity to get to work today. So I'm going to show you a few problems. I'm going to kind of skip through the lesson and then I'll have you do all your DOLs all at once. What specifically is new to the lesson today is that we are working with inequalities. The word inequality means it's not an equal sign. So this one is uh, x squared minus 8x plus 16 is, here's the word, less than or equal to 1. Inequality just means it's not an equal sign. Could be greater than, could be less than, could be less than or equal to, could be greater than or equal to, or it could be doesn't equal at all. But it's not an equal sign. So what's going to happen here? This graph we've learned is going to look like a parabola. The highest power is a squared, a squared is a parabola. This is a parabola. What we want to know is where is the parabola? This will be a flat line. We'll see it's a flat line. We want to know where is the parabola less than or equal to one, meaning visually, where is the parabola below the flat line, the flat line will be above. So we wanna know where are the areas where the parabola is below the flat line. That's what we're gonna to seek to find out. So let me erase this part here. We wanna know where is the this part of the equation below the one. So there's two ways you can do this. If you have this graph open or Desmos open, just close out the bell ringer, go to number one, because I already have this graph. Here's the first equation, x squared minus eight x, plus 16 is less than or equal to one. If you graph that, it's gonna show you the actual solution. It's gonna bind it. What I mean by bind is it's gonna have a shaded area of the screen. In this case, the shaded area goes from three to five. This is my solution set. My solution set is anything between three and five because that's the shaded area. If you look closely, I know this is harder for those on Zoom, or I'm assuming it is. I really haven't watched a Zoom. So can you tell on the outside that it's bounded by a darker, like a bolder blue line? Can you see that at home? That there is a darker blue line here? Yes. yes. Okay. If you can see that, that means you can be equal to three and five. So my solution set on this problem, here is the solution, is three comma five in brackets. 
The reason it's brackets is because that outside area had a darker blue than the inside area. It was like that dark bold. That's what means it's a bracket. And so this would be the solution set. So you might be going, what would it look like if it's not the darker bold? Well, the next one, part B, is the same equation, but they switched the symbol here. And by the way, well, less than or equal to is ge generally going to generate those bold lines. If it has the equal to symbol with it, that's going to get that. And before I forget, if you're typing these in at home, here's how you do it. You can one, open up the Desmos tools and click less than or equal to right there. Or you can just type on your keyboard just to the left of the right shift key is the less than. And after you hit the less than, if you press equals, it'll add it. But I'll take it away. You see how when I do less than, do I still have a darker bold line going down the outside? Now look what it is. Dotted. This would mean parentheses. So if you see it like that, it's a parentheses. If you see it solid, it's an equal to, or it's a bracket. So this would be my solution right here. If you wanted to, you could also write the solution as being three is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to five. Okay, now let me go back to where I said where the parabola is below this. If you wanted to solve it the way I've been saying to solve previous problems, where you draw, or like I did in the bell ringer, where you divide it at this inequality, you would type in y equals x squared minus 8x plus 16. There's that parabola. And you'll notice that if I do y equals 1, so I just broke this problem up and at its center. If I do that, you'll notice that they intersect at three and five. That's the intersection. And remember on the instructions, I said, we wanna know where the parabola is below. Do you notice how this shaded region is where the parabola is below the line? That's why it's the solution set because that's where the parabola is below. Okay, now I'm going to jump to 1B. 1B says it's the same equation, but now we wanna know where the parabola is greater than one, meaning where is the parabola above and one below? That's what we wanna know here. Where is the parabola above and the line below? And so if I come over here and change from this equation to this one, what happened? Come on now. What's going on with my graph? It's going really slow. There it is. The solution set now where the parabola is above the line is everything but that area from three to five. So I think the answer is easier to find just typing in the actual equation. But if you don't want to do it that way, you can graph each one, uh, each side of the equation and then make up your mind. Okay, the parabola is above everywhere but three to five. So this one, the solution set would look like this. It would go from negative infinity to negative three. And because it was a dotted line, it has a parenthesis. Union negative five, not negatives, it was positive three. I'm sorry, and a positive five. And five to infinity. The answer would look like this. Or if you wanted to write it in the other form, you would say x is less than three, or union is the same thing as or, x is greater than five. So this is uh, the other way you can write your answer here. So that would be um, example one. Now you're gonna have some DOLs, but before I give you the DOLs, I'm just gonna move on to the next problem. Let's say, I'm gonna come back to the uh, real world problems in a second. Let's say this was our graph. So I got some weird solutions. So I'm gonna go to three A, B, and C and D. So let's say we're looking at this. So now go to example three A. So if you're following along in Desmos, go to three A and B, that folder, and click, the very, uh, the x squared plus two x plus three is less than zero. Now what happens when you click that? What happens to you zoomers when you click that problem? 
you're, you're in the folder three A and B and click this equation that says X squared plus two X plus three is less than zero. What happens on my graph when I click it? Nothing. Nothing. Here's why. Because this problem, what we want to know is where is the parabola below, below zero? Meaning where is the parabola going to be below the flat line at zero? Well, let's look at what the pictures look like separate. Is this parabola ever below this red flat line at zero? No. It's never below. So there are times where you graph it and nothing happens. That's because there's no solution. This one would be no solution. 3A here is no solution. Because the original parabola, so x squared portion is a parabola. The original parabola never went below the line y equals zero. This parabola was never below, so there's no solution. So that's what we're supposed to find here. Where is it below? Uh, let me write that up at the top. We want to know where the parabola is below the line y equals zero. And that, so that means that zero would be above. It never happened, so there's no solution. Just the same, let's flip the inequality. So now I want to know where is the parabola above and the line y equals zero below. That's what I'm now checking. So tell me, when you look at the picture, when is the parabola above? Answer? All reals? Always, it's always above. So you could say all reals. So that's what all reals would look like graphically. So this one, you would either say, I've been writing the inequality, the, uh, interval notation first, so I'll do it again. You could, that's all reals and interval notation, or you could write it as X, E with that double R. X is an element of the reals. So you can write it either way. But that's because the parabola was always above. Okay, now I got two more weird solutions. So this is under the unusual solution sets, how you could have weird solutions. One is to have no solution. This one is to have everything as being a solution. It's always above. So here's another one. So now we're going to open up the folder for C, D, uh, 3, C, and D. So I'm going to take this one off, and I'm going to open up the folder for 3, C, and D. When I graph this one, oops, sorry, let me take off zero. OK, here's what this parabola looks like. On this problem, it's x squared plus 12x plus 36, and it gives us line equals y equals 0. So you see in the graphs, that's what they look like. If you actually graphed what the problem said, it's this link right here. Notice it looks almost like all reals. What's the difference this time between the previous graph we had for all reals? What do you notice is different? It's dotted at negative six, which this means it's all reals except for negative six. This would be all reals except for negative six. And I'll show you why again, is this equation says, where's the parabola above y equals zero. Well, the parabola is always above except for right there, they're equal to one another. And so this would be all solutions but negative six. And so if you want to draw this quick sketch so you have it for your notes later, just draw a parabola that barely touches the x-axis at negative six. So that right there is at negative six. And the other line that, it, that it's touching is y equals zero. So there's y equals zero. They intersect one another at negative six. And so the way you write all, all reals but negative six is you do from negative infinity to negative six. Since it was a dotted line, you put a parenthesis, union negative six to infinity. That's the answer in interval notation. As an inequality, you would just simply say x does not equal negative six. That means all reals except for negative six. So X does not equal negative six. You write that form. And so now one more weird solution set. It's the same problem, but this time I changed my inequality to be less than or equal to. So we're wondering where is the parabola, not above, sorry, it's less than. So when is the parabola below slash equal to this being above? Or equal. 
So y'all tell me before I actually click on the graph. When is the parabola below the line y equals zero? When was this parabola below? It's never below. Is it ever equal to one another? Yes, where are they equal to one another? At negative six. So this one, the answer would look like this, an interval notation. You just do it in brackets, negative six. And that's your solution. Or, sorry, that was ugly. Or you could say x equals negative six. Let me show it to you visually now. So this was the previous one. This is x equals negative six. It's just a one solid line and negative six. So solid line means brackets. Dotted line means parentheses. All right, so out of the four weird solutions, I'm gonna play a game real quick, real quick like a pop quiz, basically. All right, y'all ready? Um, change the order around. Which one would this be? There's four weird solutions. Is it no solution, all reals? Is it only one spot or is it all reals except for one spot? This time, what's the answer? All reals, you sure? Do you see any solid line, any dotted line? It's all reals, I agree. This would be all real solutions, okay? This one. Only one solution. Would it be brackets or parentheses? It'd be brackets. 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 Okay. What about this one? It'd be all reals except negative six. That's right. All reals except for that value, negative six. And what about this one? No solution. All right. So those are your four weird solutions you might see throughout the lesson. All right, uh, let me jump to number four. Now there's something that can happen that's different with rationals. Rational again means division. And that's that Desmos won't give you a solid dot, a solid bold line or nor the dotted line. With rationals, you're, we know, we've learned in previous lessons that you're not allowed to divide by zero. So we could say right now the domain, we are not gonna be allowed to equal negative two. If you're going, why is it negative two? It's because you're not allowed to divide by zero. That's a math rule. You're not allowed to divide by zero. So if you took that denominator and said you can't equal zero, the way to solve it is you subtract two from both sides. That's why we say always inside lies or X's lie is another thing I say. And so it, though it looked like a plus two, you'd actually say X cannot equal negative two. It lies to you. You always do the opposite of what it looks like because we always solve for X. That's gonna be our domain. What this, why is this important? I'll show you why. When you graph this one, so this is example four. When you graph this function, so here's where it is. Notice it graphs. Tell me about the edge. Is that a solid bold line on the edge or is it a dotted line on the edge? <laughs> Good, very well said. Ricardo says, I don't even see a line. That's because the answer is, None of the above. There's no line on this one. You see how there's no line? If there's no line, it's undefined, meaning parentheses. So if you don't see it's a bold line at all, dotted nor solid, it's a parenthesis. So this one would go from negative infinity, I'm looking over here, negative infinity all the way until this point. What value is that? Negative two. So this answer would be from negative infinity to negative two. Since it did not give me a solid line at all, nor a dotted line, it's a parenthesis. The reason it did not is because the domain was cut off before it ever got to the inequality portion. It eliminated it before it ever tried. That's the order the calculator went. It does their domain first before it ever tried to factor in that part. And so that's why there's not even a dotted line. The other way of writing this is X is less than negative two. Okay, if you're wondering, why is that? Why would the graph look like that? Well, I graphed them separate just to show you because I thought this was a neat graph to show. So remember, we're looking for, let me, let's interpret this. We want this portion of the graph, the rational part to be above zero. So here's zero in green. 
We want the part of the rational graph that's above the green. When I hit the rational graph, notice on the left side it's above, the right side is below. So this portion is the answer. Now when I cover in black, you'll see that that's the part that's on the above side of the line. Is this making sense? A little bit? Okay, I'm flying through here. All right, I have done all these that are mathematical problems. What I want you to do, and if you're watching this at home, not live, just pause your video, and I want you to do all your DOLs. And then once you have done the DOLs, we'll do example two together, uh, the word problem. So you should open up this. We've already done the bell ringers. So you need to do number one, number two, number three, number four. Once you've done those problems, and when I count numbers, I'm talking about example one, example two, example three, example four. I want you to do those four and then I'll come back on and we'll talk about real world problems. Any questions? All right, go ahead. All right, now I'm gonna look at example two. It, it says here that manufacturing an 18 inch by 20 inch sheet of cardboard is cut and folded to make shipping box with a height of X inches. What height should be used if the volume of the box is to be at least 252 cubic inches? So here's what I want you to do here. I wanna focus on, um, uh, so let me pause. All right, I want to let you see what's happening here. So imagine this is cardboard. Here's what I'm saying. Yeah, this piece of cardboard. It's 20 inches long and it's 18 inches tall. Or you could turn it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm sorry for, for you here, it's gonna look backwards for the zoomers, it won't. Uh, so this is the idea. If we we're gonna try to make this have volume. So right now it has area because it's flat. But if I wanted to be volume, again, tennis is um, cardboard, is you'd have to fold up the corner. So what would happen is I start to fold up this corner. I would have this side, but I'm gonna run into a problem. So I'll just kind of crease it. I'm gonna have a problem in a second. That is when I try to make the other wall, I will not stay up very well because of this corner. See, when I go this way, you see the corner becomes a problem. You're gonna have a problem every corner because you can't keep this one up and this one up without having the corner double up somehow. You either have to fold it and then curve it or whatever, but you've got a corner problem. So to help you out, I've got a different object that's gonna help me a lot more. Basically what we need to do is take this box and cut the corners because if you cut the corners, now I can fold up the walls and I have a box with volume. See what I did there? Okay, so let's talk about this. It's 20 inches long, 18 inches tall. If I were to cut out the corners, is this part across from right now, is it still 20? Did cutting this corner change the length from here to here? No, still 20. This is still 18 from top to bottom. Would you agree with that? Okay, now when I fold it, is it still 20 all the way across? It was 20 here. Is it still 20 there? Is the base, let me rephrase, is the base 20 inches? The base is not 20 inches any longer. Here it's 20 inches across. The net, if you remember that term from geometry, the net of the shape, there is 20 inches across. But when I cut the corner, fold the corners up like that, it's no longer 20 inches across, is it? So how much did I cut off in this corner? Do you know? You might guess, but do you actually know how much I cut off? Does anybody on Zoom know how much I cut off? The answer should be no. You have no clue how much I cut off. So what in math represents an amount that we don't know has been cut off? Or an unknown. What letter do we use if we have an unknown? X. X. So assume this length right here, see my finger, is X. If I cut off an X here and I cut off an X here and fold, now how long is the 20? It's 20 minus this X and minus this X. So the equation would become 20 minus two one X. and two X, 20 minus two X. What about the, the height? It was 18. When I lose this one and this one, it's now 18 minus two X. 
2x. So I'm looking at this form. You have 20 minus 2x, and I have 18 minus 2x. And you can see the answer down here I was about to ask. I'm about to ask, what should the height of the box be? Will the height be 2x? Does this have a height of 2x? Just x. People are going to say yes, but it's not. Let's go back to the start. How much did I cut off right here? Is this 2x? This is 1x. So the height is actually 1x. So my equation here to find volume is I would take my length, 20 minus 2x, I'd multiply it times the height, excuse me, the width, 18 minus 2x, and then multiply it times the height, which is x. So here's the net so you can see how it all looks. Just right there. We have 20 minus 2x for the base width length. We have 18 minus 2x for the base height. And we have a wall height of x all the way around. Okay? So when we solve this problem, we're going to go about it in this form. We're going to say, let me get back over here. To solve this problem, it says to find a volume, and it just says reminder, volume, come on right, zoom out of ink, what happened there? There we go. Is length times width times height. Now it says the volume needs to be at least 252, so we'll talk about that in a second. At least does not mean equal to necessarily. So I'll have 252 for the volume, but our length, we're no longer going to call it L. The link, I'm gonna have some symbol here, so I'm gonna leave a gap. The link is now 20. I'm gonna treat this as the original W and this is the original link. It's gonna be 20 minus 2x. That's my length. My width is now 18 minus 2x. And my height is x. The problem says the volume of the box needs to be at least 252. Be at least 252, does that mean greater than? It can be greater than, or does it mean it can be smaller than? It can be bigger than 252. So 252 is the minimum, meaning it's on the smaller end of the symbol. I need to do it this way. And at least means it can equal. So it goes like this. Now, what I've been doing the previous problems is graphing this first off, but I want you to see the equation because this is a real world. And remember with real world, like we talked about in the bell ringer, you only pay attention to the first quadrant. Anything outside the first quadrant is no longer real world. You can't have a negative volume. Would you agree with that? And we can't have a negative side length. Would you agree with that? So when we graph this, I'm gonna first graph it as two separate equations. So you can actually see this would be the volume equation. That's the volume equation. And then this second, y equals 252, is the minimum volume. It's just the straight line where we can see the baseline where I want that to be the minimum. So when I go over to our graph, I'm going to go to number two. Here's my equation. And I need, I'm going to change my settings. Uh, I know it needs to go up to at least 252. So I'm going to just do 400. I'll do this to negative 100 so we can see the axis. And I'm not paying attention to negative x's. I'll just do negative 5. But I want to go up to 20 inches here. Here's my volume. I should have gone higher. You still can't see the top. Let me go to up to 600. OK. Here's my window for volume. Is it possible? Now, volume is in the place of y. So here's my volume. My volume is the y-axis. x is how much I cut. X is the amount that I cut. Is it possible to have a negative cut or a negative volume? So I'm not going to pay attention to this part. And once I get to here, is it possible to have a negative volume? No, I won't pay attention to any part of this graph either because it left the first quadrant. This is the only part that's relevant. OK, so now to add the other baseline, I'm going to clear that out. Let's put on 252. Here's 252. We want our volume to be above. So my answer is going to be this part of the parabola. Are you in agreement with that? So if I graph the whole equation as we got it, it's going to shade these portions. Now it shades over here because this part of the parabola, I say parabola, I'm sorry, the cubic graph, it's a cubic graph, an S curve. 
this part of the S curve is above the flat line, but is this a real answer? Now it's impossible because for a period we had negative volume. And so this part is not possible. So we ignore that. This part is our answer, our solution. This is our solution area or solution region. Okay, so let's figure out what that solution region is. I'm gonna clear my ink here. My solution region would be from this point, X being eight or 0.844 to this point, 6.298. So I'm gonna write that down. Uh, the solution region would be anything, and it was a solid line. I'll go back to you and show you from eight point, I think it was four, four, I already forgot. Was it 8.44? 8.44 with a solid line, so it's bounded with brackets to 6.298. That would be the X portion, which X is the same thing as height. So the height needs to be anything between these values. Anything in there will work. And that's what the question asks us to find. What height should be used? Well, anything in there. I believe you have a homework problem where it asks you uh, what should the length be and if it was exactly 252. So if it was exactly 252, you'd pick one of these and maybe uh, subtract it to figure out what the height, the length should be or the width should be. You could plug in those values. So if you picked a height, let's say we pick a height of one, you could plug in one, one, one and find out if we have a height of one, that would mean my length should be 18, 18 and my width should be 16 because you just plug in one all the way across. So I just want to make sure you know how that works. You can pick any value in between there two, those two values and get 252 square inches or cubic inches, I'm sorry, cubic inches. Okay, so that's real world number two. Now I'm going to jump to, uh, was it five? Yeah. So again, I have a real world problem that says, Real world, what quadrant do I have to remain in? First quadrant. quadrant. It says we have a uh, carpenter making tables. And specifically, he has rectangular tops. So I'll do it just off square. It doesn't say, is it a long and narrow table or is it almost square? It does not say. All it says is that the tables are rectangular with a perimeter of 20. So if perimeter equals 20. I want to remind you, perimeter is length plus width, plus length, plus width. So perimeter, which equals two links plus two Ws has to equal 20 feet. Okay, and I'll put the unit on there in a little bit, but that's feet. That's the perimeter. And it says an area of at least 24 square feet. Help me out. If it's at least 24, does that mean I could be bigger than 24 or it could be smaller than 24? Bigger than 24. So area, which is the same thing as length times width, can be greater than or equal to 24. And we have to solve. So there, here's my equations without solving anything. I have, I'm given these two. This is called a system of equations, if you remember from algebra two. System means more than one equation. The way you solve it is with inequalities. You solve the one that's equal to and you plug it into the one that's not equal to. That's always the way you do it. You solve the one that's equal to and you plug it in to the one that's not equal to. I'm gonna solve the perimeter equation. Perimeter equation, do you wanna solve for L or for W? It doesn't matter which one. We just have to solve for one of the shared variables. L, Carter said let's solve for L, let's do it. So 2L plus 2W equals 20. How do I get the 2L by itself? How do I get rid of a 2W? Minus, we do the opposites. So I subtract 2W, which means 2L equals 20 minus 2W. Now, how do I get rid of the 2 with the L that's multiplying? What's the opposite multiplication? Division. Now with division, you distribute negatives all the way through, just like you would with multiplication. Since they're opposites, you have to distribute all the way across. So we find out the length is equal to 10 minus W. 
Now there's my work. I'm going to take this and move it over. So now, to solve for the area, I just substitute in. So the area would equal, instead of length, I'm going to put 10 minus W. I'm going to substitute times W has to be greater than or equal to 24. This is going to be my equation right here. That's my equation, if you will. Area equation is right there. Now I'm boxing this up because your DOL that you're going to work in a second asks for the equation. So that would be the equation right there for area. I found it. We solved for the length and we have that. Now let's go find the solution area. So if I graph this, I think I already have this in. Uh, yep, right here. If I graph that, the solution area goes from four to six. Would I use brackets or parentheses? Brackets. So the solution region, and this is a rectangle. So if one's four, the other one's six, that's the way it works, because you just turn your table. The solution region would be anywhere between four and six in brackets. That is specifically, this one asks for solving the quantity we used for the possible lengths. The lengths of this rectangular table, if one's four, the other six, or if it's in between, you just do it so that your primary equals 20. But it's anywhere between four and six, that would be the answer. Questions over that one? One more word problem. Painting, it says Eric can paint a house in 6.5 hours. Peter can paint the same house in six hours. If they were to hire a third painter, how fast must they paint to paint a house together in less than two hours? Now this problem that does not give us an equation. Sorry. Are we back? Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, not sure what just trailed off there, but uh, when you solve rationals, you're going to solve it with this idea in mind. So like when you're talking about speed, typically we think of speed like in terms of physics, you would say that speed is equal to whatever distance you travel divided by time. That's normally how we do it. I know a lot of us don't think of it this way, but this is truthfully how we do it. If you're in cross country, you run 10 miles in two hours, 10 miles in two hours, how fast were you running? Are you running? Yeah. Oh. I think two hours, how much? 10 miles in two hours? Yeah, if you're running 10 miles in two hours, five miles per hour. Zoom, are y'all agreeing with that? Yes. Okay, so if you ran 10 miles in two hours, you're running five miles an hour. Okay, it's the same concept with this. It's just the difference is we're going to treat the number of houses you paint as the distance. So, for example, Eric, he paints one house, a house, in 6.5 hours. So, how I want to solve that is Eric paints one house. I'll do one house. I don't know the abbreviation for house, so I'll just do it like that in 6.5 hours. Then it says Peter. He can paint the same house in six hours. So again, one house in six hours. Then it says they want to hire a third painter. So let's just do third. How fast must they paint to paint the house together in less than two hours? What that means is if you add up three painters, they paint the house together in less than two hours. I'm gonna just put an equal to sign for now, but they wanna do it less than two hours. Paint the one house together in two hours. That's how you're gonna solve this problem. Do you follow what I've done there? One house, 6.5 hours, one house, six hours. We don't know about this one, but they all we know is they paint one house. Do we know how long it takes them? No. As together, we want it to be less than two hours, but do we know this person? What do you do for an unknown? X. And so to solve this problem, I'm gonna type it in just like this. And so here is, oh wait, first I'm gonna give you, this is what the actual graphs would look like. 
you have this inequality. And uh, I didn't put, I'm sorry, these two graphs. And it's real world. So what do I not pay attention to? The negatives. So I, I, I just know a way of restricting it. I'm going to say X has got to be greater than or equal to zero. And actually, you can't paint a house in zero hours. So I'll just say it's got to be greater than zero. So I'm only looking at this part, part of the graph. What's tricky with rationals with inequalities is figuring out which way does this symbol go. And so I want to ask you, if he's a fast painter, does that mean he's going to spend less time or more time? So T is your X axis. This is time. If he is a fast painter, would he paint the house in less time or in more time? Less time. So the answer is this portion of the graph. If he's a fast painter, he's over here. If he's a slow painter, he's on this side where you divide at this line right through there. So now that I've done all that, I'm gonna clear it and use their graphics because obviously theirs is almost as good as mine. Sarcastic. So I'm gonna put this up there. It puts that line on and I try it. It says uh, to paint in less than two hours. If I tried that, does that give me the right solution set? It does not. This is not the answer. I mean, we want this part, but it doesn't give me that part, does it? We want the other part. So what's tricky about rationals and inequalities is the inequality always goes backwards. You'd think this would mean less than two hours, but if it's rational, meaning all the values on the bottom, it actually goes backwards. Whoops. So it'd be this way. This is our solution set. Eric's got to be able to paint between zero and 5.571 hours. Uh, can I be equal to two hours? When it says less than, no, that's why I did not put an equal sign here. I did a uh, greater than, no equals. So it'd be bracket zero. Actually, can I paint a house in zero hours? So I don't even need to include zero. So parentheses zero to 5.57. That's how fast the third painter has got to be. So I do from zero to five point, what was it, 571? Anywhere in there, hours. They have to be able to paint the house in this speed to accomplish the task at hand. Okay, those are your real world problems. I got one more here at the ACP question. You haven't done this, this will be a DOL, but let's do the ACP problem and then you'll have this last problem to get your 100. Matthew and some friends are going to a concert. They hire a car service for $75 to drive them to the restaurant for dinner and then to a concert. They divide the $60 cost of the dinner equally. However, since Matthew's dad provided concert tickets for the group, the friends agree that Matthew doesn't have to help pay for the car's service. The friends divide the cost equally among themselves. If each friend spends a total of $25, how many friends went to the concert with Matthew? This problem actually tells you the math that you need to do. It says it uh, here, they divide. So $60 is gonna be divided among somebody. And again, it says right here, they divide. And this is talking about car service. So the car service is 75, 75 is gonna get divided. Okay, question for you now. What is our unknown in this problem? Friends, friends is the unknown. And so I'm gonna say X equals friends. That's the unknown. So now let's go up to the problem, the $60. It says they, speaking of whom, friends divide the $60 cost of the dinner equally. However, since Matthew's dad provided the concert tickets for the group, the friends agree Matthew doesn't have to help pay for the car service. So there's a difference. For one of these, everybody pays, and for the other, only friends pay. Notice. Since that Matthew's dad provided concert tickets, the friends agree Matthew doesn't have to pay for car service. So who pays for this car service then? Just friends. Who pays for the dinner? All of them, which would be friends plus Matthew. Well, we don't do this in the equation. You don't say friends plus Matthew. How many people is Matthew? It would be X plus one. That's friends plus Matthew. They have a total. What does total mean to do? It means add. They spend a total of 25. That's our equation right there. So if we wanted to get a solution, 
you would graph this and look for the intersection, or you can type in the whole thing at once. I'll come over here. If I try to type in the equation all at once, it shows these two lines. Does it say that the answer is everything in between? Does it have everything over here? Now let's say there are two solutions. You have this negative answer and this positive answer. Real world, can I have X as friends, remember? Can you have negative friends? No. Maybe their personality, but in number, no. You can't have negative friends, so that's not real. This is your real answer. How many friends does it appear? What's in between four and six? Five, so this problem, the answer would be five friends. And I'm gonna blow some of your minds that on a free response, you don't have to do it at the front, you don't have to do it at the back. You just have to make sure you get bubbled in there exactly five. This is correct. This is correct. This is correct. That is what? That's incorrect. What about this? Incorrect, but this is correct. As long as you have five bubbled, that is correct. Uh, if you wanted to see the equation in another form, you could also separate this graph and why am I not seeing it? I need to zoom out. You could look at it this way and see why are the solutions where we had them? It's because this graph crosses right there. Here's the, the green is the, uh, the, the car service and the dinner part portion of the graph. The Y equals 25, that's the total cost where these intersect each other on the positive side or the first quadrant is at five. That's why that solution was right there at five. So five friends. Any questions about that? You got one more DOL and then you can finish up work. I'm signing off unless you have any questions, Zoomers. Thank you, Mr. Borges.